So you guys, today we are talking about relationships. And as we talked about, we want to create a relational structure around this idea of having God first in our life. And we need to do that. And so I want to start this morning and open up the scripture out of Ecclesiastes. You might think that's an odd place to start for a relationship teaching, but we're going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter four, and we want to look at verses seven through 12. And so if you, as you have your Bible, open them up. Uh, we'll put it on your screen for you as well. But Ecclesiastes four, seven through 12. I want to remind you too that you can download the Element app right on your app store, whatever platform you're on. You can download the Element app and there's actually a Bible right on that app. So uh, go to the, your uh, your store, whatever, your cell phone uh, app store and just click in Element Church. There will be a couple. You can look for our logo, click it and download. And there's actually a Bible right on there as well. So you can do that. Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 12, it says this, it says, again, I saw something meaningless or vapor-like that, that gets away from us that's hard to grasp or get your hands onto. I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone who had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For who am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless like a vapor, a miserable business. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Verse 11, also two lie down together, they'll keep each other warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Verse 12, though one may be overpowered, Two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, this scripture has been used for years in wedding ceremonies and to talk about romantic relationships. But really, the context here is not about romantic relationships, and it can be used in that context fine, but it actually is much broader than that and much bigger than that. So if you hear the scripture and you say, well, I'm not married, or well, I don't have a girlfriend, or I don't have a boyfriend, that's okay. That's not actually what this verse is actually intended to be speaking to. What the verse is speaking speaking to is there was a man who was all alone, had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. His eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? He asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This is a miserable business. The idea is that there's a man who's toiling and living his life and giving and pouring himself out. And there's no relational structure around him for the, to add purpose into what he's actually doing as an individual. I don't know if you can see that there, but it says pity to anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Again, it's not just a romantic idea. It's a friendship idea. It's a relational structure around our life idea. And it says this, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And of course, that can go in a marriage sense, but it can also go in a life relational structure sense. And the three cord strand is this. Number one is God. Number two is you. And number three is someone else, is another person. So God, yourself self and others, God, yourself, and others. And a three-cord strand is not quickly broken. A three-braided um, cord or rope is not easily broken. And the idea here is that our lives are to be lived in conjunction and woven together and braided together. It's, it's God, me, and others. It's God, you, and others. And that kind of life is not quickly broken. And so how do we do this three-chord strand thing? Well, Romans 12, 3 gives us a little bit of insight. It's not necessarily referencing the verse in Ecclesiastes specifically, but it gives us a build out of this idea. In the book of Romans, the apostle Paul writes and says this to the church at Rome. He says, do not think of yourself, there's one of the strands, more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. That's a second part, and I'll speak to that in just a second. In accordance with the measure of faith, God has given you. There's the third strand. So again, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. That's one. And then the measure of faith that God has given you, that's the God strand. And then check this out. It says, think of yourself with sober judgment. Now, this is interesting because if you look at the Greek words of yourself, you know, um, and what God has given, there's some interesting things in there for us to get a proper view of ourselves and a proper view of God, which we'll talk about in a moment. But sober judgment has a, an idea of other relationships. And here's why. Because judgment has to do, and I looked this up, judgment has to do with utilizing 
outside a specific experience, utilizing evidence outside of a specific experience in order to accurately assess and evaluate it. So I'll say like this, something happens and you're trying to evaluate or assess what's happening, but what you need to do is step outside of the thing that's happening in order to get judgment, in order to get assessment, in order to get perspective. And so you have to look outside of the thing happening in order to, to soberly assess or soberly judge. And so there's this idea in Romans 12, 3, and it again goes back to Ecclesiastes 4, where we need to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. How do we do that? Well, we think of ourselves with sober judgment. We, we assess ourselves outside of ourselves with other people in our life. There's this powerful idea that other relationships give us an objective structure by which we can honestly and soberly understand ourselves. And so you see here in Romans 12 that it's ourselves, God, and others. You see in Ecclesiastes 4, the three-chord strand is God, ourself, and others. And so this really is a foundational piece of living a God first life, of living a life worth living at all that, um, as Ecclesiastes 4 would say, um, pity to anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Um, again, de uh, de he says, I have no one that I'm toiling for. This too is meaningless and a miserable business. And so what does it look like for us to build out these three chord strands in our life and set up these foundational relationships so that we can live a God first kind of life. So I have three points for you today. I bet you can guess what they are already, but if you can't, I'm going to give them to you. Number one, are you ready? Number one is relationship with God. And that is the first of the three chord strand is that we see God as he is. So the first step is for us to see God as he is, is to get our relationship with God right now. Um, I want to go to a story and it's going to be a running story for us this morning out of, uh, it's about a, a story about a man named Gideon and it's out of the book of Judges chapter six. So already this morning, we are doing a good job navigating our Bibles, you guys. We've been in Ecclesiastes, we've been in Romans, and now we're into Judges. Here we go. R Judges 6, and I'm going to read a couple verses for us here. They'll be on your screen. We're going to read and start in verse 11. And this is, a, again, a man named Gideon. We're going to see his story here talking about relationship with God and seeing God as he truly is, the first of the three-chord strand. Judges 6, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, not Oprah, Ophra, <laughs> that belonged to Joash, the Aborizite. I, I, I actually have no idea if I actually said that properly. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the Lord, uh, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So here's the deal. There's a man named Gideon and he's hiding in a wine press because he's afraid of basically the oppressive forces of the day. The angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So if you can imagine, you're living in a culture where you're afraid of an oppressive power. You're actually literally physically hiding from that power. And an angel shows up and said, the Lord is with you, enter your name, you mighty warrior. And Gideon does what probably most of us would do is he actually functionally looks over his shoulder to see if the angel's talking to someone else. Check it out. Verse 13, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? He's like, you must be talking to someone else. I don't think you're talking to me. And he starts out and what he says is, God, if you were really with us, all of this external circumstantial stuff would look way better. And as we've been through the year of 2020, I, I don't know if you can relate with that. I know there's been moments where I can, um, where we're like, hey, God, where are you? Like, God, if you're really who you say you are, and God, if you're really good, then why are all these things happening? Look at what Gideon says. If the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Why are we under this circumstance that's really negative? Why are all of his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, well, where are all of his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? He's like, look, we've heard you do great things, but you're not doing great things now. I mean, we've heard that you delivered our people, but you're not delivering us now. But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Verse 14. Well, I'll pause. Do you see what he's saying? Gideon's like, look, you showed up and said that you're with me and you, you called, you, you told me something about yourself, but God, I don't really know about you. I don't really know about your nature because what I'm seeing circumstantially makes me question whether you're good, whether you really care and whether you're really with me. And again, I think so many of us can probably, if we're honest and sober, relate to this in some way. And look what God says to Gideon. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not 
sending you. So it's really interesting because this idea of circumstantial challenge, someone crying out to God about it and actually even questioning his character, and then God actually answering with, I'm paraphrasing, yeah, I see the problem too. Guess what? I want you to do something about it. This happens all through the scripture. It happens here with Gideon. It happens with Moses too, almost verbatim. You guys, if you go back and look at the Exodus that Gideon's talking about, he's like, hey, you know, we heard that you delivered us out of Egypt, but where are you now, big shot? Where are you now, God? Where are you at? Because I don't think you're really here. I don't think you really care. And God gives the almost verbatim answer to Gideon that he gave to Moses at the burning bush. And, and he says this, I'm paraphrasing. God says, I see the problem too. I want to do something about it too, so I'm going to send you to do something about it. And it's really fascinating. And then Gideon, almost verbatim, quotes Moses. Um, verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? I, uh, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. It's the same thing Moses said. I'm a nobody. I don't have anything to bring. God, I'm not really the right person. You got the wrong guy. And Gideon says the same thing. I'm the weakest in the clan of the weakest clan. Like, I'm like the nobody of nobodies. How are you possibly calling me? And I think what's amazing is that here in verse 13, Gideon, all through these verses, Gideon's challenging God about what he's not doing while God is inviting Gideon into the thing that he is doing. And it's fascinating to me that so often we can look at the circumstance and say, God, I don't think you're good, or God, I don't think you're powerful, or God, I don't think you're present. And oftentimes in the same that stir, that frustration, that anger in that same exact place is the place God is calling us to do something. That is the place that God is moving. That is the place God is speaking. And we're like, God, I'm frustrated and therefore you're not moving. And God's like, no, no, you're frustrated. That's the proof that I'm moving and calling you to something else. And we've got to, you guys, start seeing God clearly. That even though we have circumstantial challenges, that does not mean God has abandoned us. And it does not mean that God's not present. It actually means quite the contrary. That typically when that stir happens, God's calling us to something active. And, um, you know, Gideon says, why has all this happened? And the Lord, the Lord's abandoned us. You're not really here. God, I'm focusing on where you're not moving. And in verse 14, God offers Gideon an invitation. And he says, um, hey, go in the strength you have. I've already given you something to work with. Use what you've been given. And then I'm sending you this is what I am doing. Now, this is interesting because um, it makes me uh, go back and remind, uh, it reminded me of a story that I've shared once or twice before, I think, um, about teaching my kids to swim. And at our old house, when we lived there, we had a pool and we had this little kitty slide. So at our pool, we would set up the little kid slide. And when I mean little kid slide, it's like one of the toddler ones, like the, it's like a, you know, three foot slide or whatever, you know, the little tykes, plastic, red plastic and blue uh, ladder. I think there was some yellow on it or whatever. And our kids and like in their, I mean, diapers, like swimmy diapers, they would climb up this little, you know, two and a half foot step, two steps, and they would get on and they would, they had the floaties and the swimmers. We actually had the ones that was all the way across the front and then onto the arms and it clipped in the back. It was like they were not going under, right? And, um, and they'd climb up and they'd slide down the thing and they'd hit the water and they'd go under and they'd come up and I'd catch them. And just let them, I'm right, dad's right here and I'd catch them. And then I'd, I'd, I'd float them over to the stairs to get out of the pool, which was a couple feet from me. They'd climb up the stairs, they'd get out, they'd go around and they'd slide down the slide again. And that was our pattern. That was our process. Hey, I'm, dad's right here. Hey, I got you. Hey, by the way, you got floaties on, but that I've given you, but no worries about, and, and I'll put you over and I'll put you over. And then there would come a time, as you can imagine, where I would just start to kind of incrementally link it up. And so then they'd climb and they'd go and they'd come down and they'd hit the water and go under and come up and I wouldn't catch them. And of course they got a floaty and then they swim over and you know, they do it again. And then eventually, right, we start trying to teach them to swim. So we would take the floaty off and then they'd climb up the ladder. They'd come down, slide, hit under, they'd come up as I'm bringing them up, they'd come up and then I'd send them over and then they would come down, hit the water, come down. I wouldn't help them out of the water. They'd come up and I'd catch them. Hey, dad's right here. And I'd send them over. Eventually, here was the moment. No floaty, swimmy diaper, up the stairs, up the thing, down the slide, under the water. They'd come up and dad doesn't catch them. 
And of course, as you can imagine, I remember one of my kids coming up out of the water and of course, water's coming down over their face. They can't see anything. They're afraid to open their eyes and they're expecting me to catch them. And I didn't. And here's what's really, really interesting is I was right in front of their face, literally right in front of their face. And I'm saying to them, come on, swim. You can do it. Now I know they can swim. I know they can do it. I've been incrementally teaching them. And I said, come on, come on. You got this. You can. And, and I remember one of them. I don't remember which one it was. So I won't rat any of them out. Cause I actually don't even remember. I wouldn't rat them out anyway. Um, I remember one of them coming up out of the water and I was like, I was like, I'm right here. You can do it. And they, they were, they were doing this and they're like, ah, ah. And I said, you can do it. And then, ah, and it, and it frantically, frantically built. And I, I remember them going, ah, and it was like, I'm dying, you know, I'm dying. And of course they're not because they're right in front of me and they're within reach of me every single moment. And I kept saying to them, come on, I'm right here. Come on, I'm right here. And what I'm doing is teaching them to take the next step into who they're supposed to be as a swimmer. And I think God is doing so much of the same way. He's incrementally stepping us up into the next thing. And we so often say, God, where are you? God, I'm, I'm drowning here. I've gone under the water and I've come up and you're not anywhere around. You're not touching me anymore. You're not sending me to the stairs anymore. I don't have the floaties anymore. You've put me out here and you've abandoned me and you're nowhere to be found. And it's like God is right in front of our face. We're, we're screaming out and clawing out. And he's like, I'm right here. I'm right here. Use what you have and swim. Go, I am with you. And if you have a moment, where you need to be caught, I will catch you because I'm a good father and I'm not going to let you drown. And our father is right there. Our father is always within catching distance of us. And so often we look just like Gideon did and we look and we say, God, where are you? God, if you were really good and if you really cared and if you were really with me, you'd be doing something. And God's like, I am with you. <laughs> it's actually fascinating that God's actually the angels in the wine press talking to Gideon and Gideon's pointing his finger at him going, you're really not present. You're really not around. If you really cared, you would be changing something. And there's literally an angel with him in the wine press where he's hiding going, you're a mighty warrior so fascinating to me is that we so often look around at the circumstance and go, God, you're not really moving. And God is in the wine press with us whispering in our ear, I'm calling you to something new. And I'm right here to catch you. Verse 13, pardon, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us. Why has all this happened? We, we read all of that. Um, verse 14, God shows up and he says, uh, Hey, you know, I know you're the weakest of the weak, but he, he calls him and, uh, and he calls him into something new. And, and I want to, Psalm 59, 10 says this, it says, my God is changeless in his love for me. And whenever we are questioning God because of our circumstance, we need to remember that God is near and God is present and his love is changeless for us. And God will not abandon us and God will not let us drown. God is always within reaching distance, but he's often calling us to do something new. And so if we're going to start out with relationships and the three chord strand, the first thing we got to get is our relationship with God. We got to see him as he truly is. Is. That's the first part of the three-chord strand. The second part of the three-chord strand is that we've got to see ourself as God sees us. So it's relationship with self, and I got to see myself as God sees me. So first, I got to, it's relationship with God, and I got to see him as he is. But second, I got to see myself as God sees me. And this is more challenging than we might give credit to because we so often see ourselves as we see ourselves, which makes sense because we're us and we get to see ourselves. But here's the thing. God has a vision of you and of me that's different than your vision of you and my vision of me or your vision of me or my vision of you. And really what we need to do if we're going to have a three chord strand kind of foundational relationship kind of life in the God first life is that we need to start to see ourselves as God sees us. Now, it's interesting because Gideon saw Gideon one way, but God saw Gideon in a different way. And we pick the story back up here in Judges 6 verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And, um, you know, it goes on. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? That's what we talked about. Check the next verse. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. Now we already read that. 
But let's look at how Gideon sees Gideon. I am the weakest of the weak. When God shows up and says, Gideon, mighty warrior, Gideon literally, I think, probably looked behind him. Like, you can't be talking to me. And, and God shows up. And then when Gideon says, but how can this be? Because I'm the weakest of the weak. God, in one phrase, totally redefines Gideon's identity and Gideon's perspective. Check this out. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you. Now, can I tell you that there is a huge difference between my assessment of me operating in my own strength and power and ability and me operating when God and the power of God and the presence and spirit of God is living on the inside of me and operating through me. Those are two very different visions for life. Those are two very different stories that we would live out. One is I'm dependent on my own strength and ability. One is God's spirit is in me and living in me. And that totally fundamentally changes the way that I see myself myself because I begin to see myself the way God sees me instead of how I see me. Again, I'll throw back to Moses. Moses was the same way. God shows up to Moses at the burning bush. And do you know the answer when Moses says, Moses says, I'm a nobody. I don't speak good. Um, I don't have anybody for you to send with me. Um, and then Moses finally just says what some of us might say if we were just totally brutally honest is just please send someone else. I mean, he just tells God straight out like, please just send somebody else. I, I do, I, I'm not the person for the job. And God answers him in the same way every time. Do you know what he says to Moses? He doesn't say, I'll make you great. He doesn't say, I'll make you powerful. He doesn't say, I will, I will make you this amazing king and this leader and whatever, and I'll take away your speech impediment, Moses. And I'll, No, he doesn't say any of that. What he says is, I'll go with you. I will be with you. That's the answer that God gives us that changes our identity. And it's the same thing that he does here with Gideon. He doesn't say to Gideon, I will make you the most powerful, although Gideon became powerful. God says, I will be with you. Gideon says, I need to see myself different. I, you're going to have to see yourself different. So Gideon has the excuses. I'm weak. I'm the weakest of the weak. And God says, I'll go with you. Moses says, I don't speak well. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm undone. I'm, I'm not the right kind of person. Please send someone else. And God says, I'll be with you. And so I want to ask you the question, what is your excuse? When God shows up, whether it's a burning bush or a wine press or something like a morning prayer time, and God shows up and he speaks to you in the place of frustration where we've not seen God clearly and we begin to be frustrated and we begin to cry out to God and God shows up and says, you know, you can do something about that. And we say to him, uh, sorry, sir, no, I can't because fill in the blank. What's your blank? I'm not smart enough. I'm not bold enough. I'm too bold. Uh, I'm too prideful. I'm not detailed enough. I'm too detailed. Um, I don't have what I need. I have too much stuff. I can't get, I can't get it all under control. I don't know what your blank is, but whatever your thing is, you can fill in that blank. And here's what's fascinating. God will deal with the blank, but it's not what he does first. What God does first is remind you that he'll be with you. And what he does first is remind you that you're a different kind of entity or being or person than what you think because he's with you, that you're not operating out of your own smarts or your own boldness or non-boldness or your own detailed or non-detailed or your own, I don't have enough or I have too much. That's the wrong game to play, gang. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. What we're supposed to be doing is seeing ourselves as God sees us. And the way God sees us is I'll go with you. God sees us fundamentally different than we see us because we see us as us and God sees us as him in us. And I love how Bishop Hall puts it. He says this, when God calls Gideon valiant, he makes him so. When God shows up and says, you're this, say, but I'm not that. And God says, oh, yes, you are. You go, but I'm really not though, God. You really need to check your stats on this. And God says, no, I'll go with you. And when God calls Gideon valiant, he makes him so. Judges 6, 23, but the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. And I love that that's how I probably feel a lot of times when God shows up and says, you can do this. And I'm like coming up out of the water, no floaties on. And I'm like, ah, you, ah I'm going to drown. And God's like, hey, hey, I'm right here. Peace, don't be afraid, you're not going to die because I am with you. 
And we're going to need to see God as he is. And number two, we're going to have to start seeing ourselves as God sees us. Now, uh, this begs a question, and I think it's a good one, and you may be having it. Is okay, Pastor Scott, great. But then what do I do with all of my honest weaknesses? Because they're real, and they don't just disappear because God is with me. Like, that doesn't just, like, not show up anymore. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and disappoint some people. I'm going to hurt some people, and I'm going to be not bold enough, or I'm going to be too bold, or whatever it might be. Well, here's the deal. God gives us some clarity on this, and, and it's one of, uh, this is not scripture, but it, it, it's scripture. It's not exactly e- explicitly stated this way in scripture, but it is, it is scripture in totality. And I love how Sam Alberry puts it. He says this, he says, number one, God loves us as we are. Number two, he doesn't leave us as we are. And then he says, either of those points without the other isn't good news. Let me say it like this. God loves us just as we are, right where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. And here's when God shows up with Gideon, he doesn't just show up and go, Gideon, you don't have any work to do anymore because I'm with you. He shows up to Gideon and says, "Uh, yeah, you actually are the weakest of the weakest clan, but I see you differently because I will be with you and where I call you, I'll provide for you. And he says to Gideon, come on, rise up, let's go. And simultaneously what's happening is God is loving him right where he is as the weakest of the weak in the clan. And God is refusing to leave him where he is as the weakest of the weak in the clan. And that he does the same thing to you and the same thing to me when he invites us into something. He says, where I call you, I'll equip you. And remember this, yes, I love you just as you are. So you can be confident in that. You don't have to fabricate an identity. You don't have to earn my love. You don't have to worry about that. And yes, I will be picking at the spots where that are weak and I will be helping you correct them. It's like when the, when the, my kid comes down and dunks in the pool, it's like, I, I love them right where they are. I'm with them right where they are. And I'm also teaching them something new and it's both. And, and so I'll say this, some of us need to sink into the first part of that. Some of us, we do not yet understand God's grace and love for us. And our shame is oppressive and we need to let God's love and, and, and sufficiency in us lift us up. And we need to see ourselves different because we receive God's divine grace and forgiveness and empowerment over our lives. We need to be loved just as we are. And some of us listening today, you need to sink deeply into the first part. You need to know God shows up and speaks a better word over you. God shows up and says, oh, mighty person of valor, you are mighty and powerful and I have come to be with you. Some of us just need to soak in that and we need to change the way we see ourselves by sinking deeply into the first one. I'm loved right where I am. Some of us, we've, we've gotten that, or some of us might even be wired more for that with a personality. Some of us need to sink into the second one. We need God to come and, and, and we need God to challenge us and to change us. And we need to see ourselves differently. Some of us see ourselves as very loved, but very non-powerful. Like you might go, well, I know God. Some people are like, I don't know God loves me. I don't know that God's grace is for me. I'm, I deal with shame or whatever. Some of us are like, I don't deal with any of that. I feel loved. I know God loves me. I don't deal with shame. Some people's shame comes in or some people's uh, weakness comes in because they're like, but I'm not powerful. I'm not really doing anything. I don't like, I know I feel loved, but I don't feel effective. And for some of us, we need to change the way we think because, hey, listen, everybody, God has called you. He says, use what you have, go in the power I've given you, and I will go with you. So we need God's grace, and we also need God's truth. And God's grace and love defeats shame and lifts up those who don't feel loved. And God's truth and holiness defeats pride and humbles us to bring us low and to send us out into his mission. Judges 6, 22 through 24 says this in the story of Gideon, says, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. I've met God. Verse 24, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace or the Lord is shalom. Do you see what happened? God met Gideon and gave him a new identity. And Gideon built an altar and said, God has come, met me in a powerful way. And now I'm calling it shalom, peace. Let me, let me put that in paraphrase for us. I look in the mirror and I'm at peace with the person that I see. I look in the mirror and I'm okay with what I see because God loves you right where you are and he's not going to leave you there. And without either one of those, it's not good news. I'll read this um, last two little things here and then I'm going to move to point three. 
Brian Houston says this about this idea of us seeing ourselves differently when we understand God is in us. He says, our, our names have limitations. If we only live within our own authority and influence, then we will always be constrained. Only one name elevates you beyond your natural limitations. It is the name that can cause you to go where you've never gone, to do what you've never done or even imagined yourself capable of doing. It's a name equally personal as it is powerful, as intimate as it is universal, both exclusive in being the only way to God and yet totally inclusive in its invitation to all people, Jesus Christ, Lord. And there is something fundamentally that shifts in us about the way we see ourselves when we know God says, I'll go with you. And I love this, and I've been referencing Moses all morning, but in Hebrews eleven twenty four, check out, this is like the clincher on this idea. Check this out. Hebrews eleven twenty four says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Check it out. By faith, Moses chose, by faith, to lay down his own inherited ability. He was raised up in Pharaoh's kingdom. He was raised up as a leader. He was raised up with wealth. He was raised up with authority. And by faith, he looked at all the world had given him and all he was in his own person. And he said, by faith, I choose to lay that down and refuse to be known by my own sufficiency so that I can enter into the person that God is calling me to be. I see myself differently. And I believe that by faith this morning, we need to do the same thing. So the question for you as we end out point two is what part of your identity needs to be by faith refused and laid down so that you can replace it with God's vision for you? Because God sees you different probably than you see you. And if we're going to do a God first life and we're going to have foundational relationships with a three chord strand, we have to see God as he is. Number one, number two, we have to see ourselves as God sees us. Number three, and my last point for this morning is that we need relationship with others. And that's the third part of the strand is we need to be with people who desire to see God as he is and who desire to see us as God sees us. I need to be around people that want to see God as he is and that want to see me as God sees me. Now, of course, none of us will be perfect in that, but that's the goal is in a three-chord strand to see God as he is, to see myself as God sees me, and then to surround my, myself with people that are doing the first two things. And by the way, that's called the church. Um, that's called the church, that's the people of God coming together so that we can endeavor to see God as he is and to see ourselves as God sees us, to see each other that way and to call each other in that kind of way. Now, here's what's interesting. We've been reading about Gideon all morning and in Judges 6, God shows up, calls Gideon. If you read the rest of Judges 6, what ends up happening is that they actually go out on their first mission and they tear down the temples and, and um, the altars to the prophet Baal. And they move into mission and purpose. So God calls Gideon, and then Gideon moves into mission and purpose. And what ends up happening right after they move into mission and purpose, which is what God calls all of us to, is God starts to speak to him about the relationships that are around him, the other people that are around him. As you move into Judges 7, we see something fascinating start to happen. God does two things with Gideon's external relationships. Number one, or A here in the points, is he organizes and structures Gideon's relationships for the mission that they're on. And number two, he actually prunes the relationships that Gideon has so he can be effective in the mission and purpose that he's on. Check it out. Judges 7, 1 through 2, it says this, early in the morning, Jerub Bell, that's Gideon, and all of his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Now, let me tell you what all of that means to me. There's a lot of structure and organization here. Okay, um, it says Gideon and all of his men. So that means he has men. That means that there's some clarity there. They're camped at the spring of Herod. So that means they're located together. They're in a locale together. They're not just spread out and whatever. They're, there's actually Gideon has men who are following him. There's vision and structure there. And then they're actually camping together at the spring of Herod. And then check this out. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Verse two, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. Now, listen, I just want to say to some of us this morning, um, we might have too many people in our life. For some of us, we don't have, we're not organized or structured in the relationships that we have. For some of us, we might have too many relationships and it could be either one. 
right? For some of us, we might need to lean into the organized structure of relationships more. For some of us, we might need to lean into the pruning side more. I don't know what it is for you, but um, for Gideon, God was shaping both of those up for him. Check this out. If we keep reading here in verse two, this is not on your screen, but it's in the Bible that you have in your hand. It says, I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My, my own strength has saved me. God's saying, look, I need to prune the relationships down because I want to work through people who will give me the glory when I do what I'm going to do. That's really interesting. So here's what happens. Um, if you keep reading here, there's 22,000 men who are, <clears throat> no, let me read it. Verse three. Now announce to the ar army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. So um, they said, hey, if you're afraid, you can go ahead and go home. And some of those people left. Actually, 22,000 left, almost um, two thirds. Well, two thirds, yeah, over that. Um, verse four, then the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I'll thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he'll sh he should go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he won't go. Verse five. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Gideon, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but he kept the 300. Now, this is really interesting because we're called to love everyone, but we're not called to go to war with everyone. We're called to love everybody, but we're called to be intentional about the relationships that are around us. And, you know, um, there's Bible scholars that have debated this for a long time as to um, why the, the lapping, you know, getting down on knees to lap or, or drinking with your hand, like what is that all about? Um, I, I read some commentary on this, and the best thing that I can find as I've studied this out is that if you got down to drink out of the water by dipping your face down to the water, you couldn't see an enemy that was coming. But if you got down and you cupped water with your hand and you drank it out of your hand, you could literally, um, and I wrote this down in my notes, you could watch for the enemy while you drank. I, I put it this way. They did everyday tasks with their eyes still on the mission at hand. They did everyday tasks with their eyes still on the mission at hand. They were thinking simultaneously about the fight they were in and the things that needed to be done to maintain everyday life. And I think this is significant. And what's amazing to me is that God dwindled this down both through organization and through, um, uh, through, through pruning to give Gideon 300 people. And 300 people who were doing everyday tasks while they had their mission eyes on the fight. They were mission focused, they were organized, and they were pruned. And I believe that in 2021, you guys, God is calling us as his people to get more intentional about the relationships we have around us, that we need to be mission focused, we need to be organized, and we need to be pruned. And I want to challenge us with that because... Um, God dropped the numbers down. There was one Israelite troop for every 400 Midianite troops. God does not need large numbers to do miraculous things. God can fight his battles with people that are mission focused, organized, and have pruned relationships. And so we need friends who see God for who he is, see us or endeavor to see us the way God sees us, and who will see the mission of God for what it is and see, see, see God for who he is, try to see us for who we are, and go on this journey of mission together. I want to give you a couple last things here before I pray over us, is we see the, this built out in different models in the New Testament. Um, it's really, really interesting. I'll give you three quickly, but um, one is in the book of Acts where we talk about the early church. And so many people quote this verse about the early church. Is it, says, um, it says that they devoted, they gathered together in houses and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, 
um, to, to prayer and to fellowship. And so there's this idea in the New Testament church that, yes, they were meeting in homes together, but there was also this idea that they were linked up with the apostles. There was an organized mission that they were linked into, and they were meeting in homes relationally organized together, and they had pruned relationships where they were really focused and dedicated. So you see one model there. Another model you see is Jesus's ministry. Um, you see Jesus's ministry. Jesus had rings of relationships. I could call it that, okay? Check this out. Jesus loved the multitudes. It's why he came. He looked at the multitudes and said, oh, how I long to gather you. He said, for the world is why Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came for the entire world, for the multitudes. He loved everybody, but Jesus didn't let everybody close to him. It's really fascinating to me. Jesus disappointed a lot of people. There was actually people in the New Testament that said, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, no, you can't follow me directly. You need to go back to your town and you need to do ministry. But Jesus had circles or rings of relationship. Now, again, we understand in the new covenant, we can all be close to Jesus. That's not the point. The point is Jesus structured his relationships in a certain way. Check this out. As a man, he structured his relationships in a certain way. He loved the multitudes. And then Jesus had the 70. And the 70 are the people that Jesus did ministry with. They did ministry together. Jesus did ministry together with the 70. Then there was the 12. And there was 12 where Jesus operated in close relationship. They lived life together. They, they, they walked and had the same experiences together. There was the 12. So, so love the multitudes, 70 in ministry together, 12 living life together. And then check this out. Then there was three that Jesus had in only intimate spaces. He had very intimate relationship with him. When Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to travail, he calls the three to go with them. When he goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration to literally be tr transfigured into God, he calls the three to go with him. Over and over and over again, we see him call those three out into intimate places where he's personally vulnerable and intimate. He calls them in. And then, of course, we see Jesus withdraw and live for the audience of one. He goes with his father. So we see Jesus's life as a man modeled that he loved the multitudes. He did ministry with the 70. He lived life with the 12. He was intimate in vulnerable spaces with the three, and he lived his life for the audience of one. That's a good model that we can start to build our relationship and structure our lives around. And then the last example I'll give you out of the New Testament here is the life of Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy because Paul was an apostle and he traveled around and planted churches. And Paul was a mentor to many. But Paul had a, an associate named Barnabas, who, whose name means son of encouragement. And Paul and Barnabas were like, so Paul was a mentor to many, but Barnabas was like an equal with Paul. Barnabas was a co-laborer with Paul. And actually we see where they actually, uh, they actually um, split, they, they, they go different ways at one point. So Paul and Barnabas, our brothers or sisters. So you have mentors, you have brothers and sisters, and then we have Timothy. Timothy was actually a mentee. He was being mentored by Paul. He was being mentored by Barnabas. He was being mentored by those who were older, more mature in the faith, not older by age, but more mature in the faith. And so what we see is we see mentors, we see brothers, we see fathers and mothers, we see brothers and sisters, and then we see kids. We see uh, mentees. We see those we're investing in, the next generation. And so again, that's not just a, a, a biological age. It's a maturity thing in the faith. So we see mentors, we see co-laborers or equals, and then we see mentees. And what we need to understand is that for all of us, we need those three types of relationship in our life. So I want to ask you, who's, who's a mentor to you? Who's someone that you give permission that they can speak into your life and press on things that are uncomfortable? And I get to tell you, as a pastor, uh, this is just a vulnerable moment for me as a pastor, I so wish that that, that door that that was an intentional open door for more people because I have seen my relationships with people who've given an open door for that, for me to speak into their life. Amazing things can happen. And I wanna challenge you to open that door to someone. You need to open it to a pastor. You need to open it to a mentor. You need to open it to a spiritual mother or father in the faith. You need to open that door intentionally and say, I view you as a mentor and I ask you to speak into my life. That's a relationship you need. And you don't need one of them. You probably need a circle of them. And we've 
talked about this before. It's hard to find one person who mentors you in every area. So you might need, if you're married and have kids, you might need a person who's more mature than you as a parent that you go, man, that person mentors me as a parent. If, if you're in a spiritual realm, you might need a mentor for you who's walked the journey of faith longer or is more mature in the spiritual faith. And you need to open yourself up to that because only when you open yourself up to a mentor, can you actually receive wisdom from them? If you go to the doctor and the doctor says to you, you need to X, Y, Z to get healthier. And you go, man, I'm not listening to that feedback. You cannot gain the health from the doctor. If you go to the dentist and they say, you need to do this with your tooth and you go, man, you cannot gain the health of your tooth. It works the same way. We all need mentors. And I got to just be bluntly honest with you in Western culture. We're so bad at this because we are individuals and we make our own way and we are follow our own hearts and we're our own person and you be you and don't let anyone tell you. Can I tell you, you can be you, but there's a lot of people that aren't gonna like you. And can I tell you something else? Yes, you need to be you and yes, you need to have that internal fortitude to stand with God with conviction for what's right, but you better open a door to some voices in your life. And you know, it's, um, do it, yeah, I'm going here. So listen, I am, I'm, I'm concerned with the model of church that is this kind of like cell um, home church thing a little bit. I'm not against people meeting in homes to worship God, but can I tell you, there's something that can be part of that movement. I'm not saying it's part of all of those movements. There's a piece that can be part of that movement. And what it is, is it's like, I want to surround myself with people I'm comfortable with, and I want to be in my home, and I want to do faith my way. And can I tell you, that is not the gospel. The gospel is we're surrounded by people that aren't like us, and we're surrounded by people that make us uncomfortable, and we're surrounded by people that are different than us, and we are coming together in a diversity to actually move toward one mission together. And can I tell you something? Mission and function and purpose require organization and, and strategy and planning and leadership, and that all has to come together. And so if you agree with that, which I think you probably do, then I would ask you the question, great. So then we're in agreement. We need to build structure, and we need leadership and we need authority. We're already in agreement on that. So the question is not whether we should all disband the church so we can all meet in homes. The question is, what does the authority and structure and unification and unity and movement look like? Now, that's a great conversation, and I'd love to have that with people, and we could talk about church models and all of that. But I want to challenge some of us because COVID has kind of dis distributed us, and I think for some of us, we've kind of subtly started to move to the corners of our faith and say, I really don't need need really many other people. I'm just going to kind of do my thing. And I will tell you that in the Bible, I just don't see that as a model. Um, I see that we need Pauls and mentors in our life. We need brothers, Barnabas's brothers and sisters. And we do need that. I would say that's kind of that church model thing that I was talking about. And then we need Timothy's. And that's the other thing that gets lost in that church model too, is we need people we're investing in and pouring into. And so I want to continue to challenge us with the, not the, the quantity of relationship, but the quality of relationship. And what God calls Gideon to after he moves him into mission is for him to organize and structure his relationship and to prune his relationships. And so I want to challenge you about the, the quality of the relationships that you have. And if we're going to live a God first kind of life, and we're going to have a three chord strand, then guys, we're going to need to see God for who he is. We're going to need to see ourselves as God sees us. And we're going to need to surround ourselves with people in an organized function and fashion and in an intentional fashion and prune off other relationships that are unneeded. And again, we love the multitudes. It's not that like we don't talk to people anymore. We talk to everybody. We, we love people. But who is in our, our circle of relationship, our ring of relationship? We need to be much more strategic with that in this next season. And I'll close with this thought. Proverbs 27. 717 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the countenance of his friend. And if you look at the word countenance, that is their face, both figuratively and literally, it's an overarching identity. Windows are an eyes, eyes are a window to the soul. It's that our friends sharpen our identity, our relationships sharpen our relationship with God, our relationship with ourself, and our relationship with others. So who are, who are the people whose voices is going to be shaping your life in 2021? Who's going to go to war with you? Who are your 12? Who are your three? 
And I, I think we need to be very intentional with that. And I want to continue to just say, I think Element Church is the place where we need to work that out together. We need to build those relationships together because God has a plan and a purpose for us as a church. And God is going to move in powerful ways in 2021. I also uh, want to let you know we are launching e-groups today. And so if you're not in a group and you want to be in a group, go to the element.church backslash e-groups and find some friends. The small group semester will be beginning over the next couple weeks. Let me pray over us this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for relationships. God, I pray for connective relationships at Element Church. God, I pray that you would give us wartime friends. God, that you would give us wisdom and knowledge of how to structure our relational world. God, both to see you as you are, all three, God, to see you as you are, to see ourselves as you see us. And then God, we need external relationships around us in order to do those first two things. So God, I pray for those connective relationships. I pray you open doors and you help us be a sticky church. God, a, a church where relationships are sticky, God, where, where we are friends, God, where we go to war together, where we're on the same mission, God, where we're unified around one common purpose, and that's you, Jesus. We are all about you. Everything that we are is for you, and we open ourselves up to you. And God, I pray that over us as a people, God, that we could see you as you are. We could see ourselves as you see us, and we could establish relationship, relationships with others who desire to see you the way you are and to see us the way you are you see us. God, I pray that over us as a people. And God, that's a supernatural work. So we need your power. And I pray that over us. God, even our church at home groups that are meeting right now, I pray that over each living room right now. Even today, as we have conversations in those rooms, would you just, would you bond hearts together? Would you give us wisdom, God, to find one another? God, would you build strong relationships together? And I just pray for anybody who's never received you, Jesus. They've never started a relationship with you. That's obviously the most important of the three strands. It's the first strand. And so I just pray right now, if you've never received Jesus, you've never personally known God for yourself and you want to do that, pray this with me. If you've done that at one time before and you want to come back home today, pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I've been running my own life and I don't want to do that anymore. Would you come in and take over? I, I don't need to get better. I need a savior and I don't need to try harder. I need you to come and give me a new life. So today, God, I thank you for doing that work through the person of Jesus Christ. You are my Lord and Savior, and I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I thank you, God, for a new beginning and a fresh start. And I thank you today, God, that you are with me and that you love me. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, hey, if you prayed that prayer today, um, we just want to invite you to text the keyword element to 97,000, and uh, you'll get a little link to your phone. You can click that. And um, you can fill out that form. Let us know you started a relationship with Jesus today. Click that box, and uh, we'd love to get in touch with you. I want to invite my wife, Pastor Erica, back, and uh, we're going to close down this teaching uh, for today. Yeah, I just wanted to give you an uh, opportunity, Pastor Scott, to maybe build out. I love your passion, and you're, I'm so thankful for um, just the way that the Holy Spirit leads you. So could you maybe share a little bit the difference between um, the church at home groups that we have operating right now versus maybe what you were speaking to, because I think there could maybe be a little bit of confusion yeah. uh, there. I can. Of Thank <laughs> you. The difference. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, yeah. and two things. Number one, um, thankful for good wives and, and uh, good pastors, co-leaders. So thank you. You know, when you speak um, a lot, right, you, you do talk about things and sometimes there isn't a huge amount of clarity or sometimes you think you're being clear about something. So thank you. I don't always know. Um, yeah, you guys, there's a lot of church models out there right now. My concern is that COVID has distributed the church. And there are a lot of people that are having conversations about, well, maybe we don't actually need to corporately gather anymore. Okay. Or be a part of a bigger local church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I'm not talking about, so our church at home groups are gathering today in smaller groups in homes, but we're all still part of a church that's moving together. There are, um, there are movements out there that would say, well, you really don't need that corporate piece. What you really just need to do is find a couple people in your life, like us four and no more. And I remember one time um, I read a book and um, there was a model of church where someone literally said, they said, well, me and three of my buddies go to the golf course on Sunday and that's church for me. And I think that that idea of, well, we get together with a couple other people and we talk about God and we might read our Bibles and whatever, that becomes church. And I think what that misses is a couple things. I think it misses shared mission. 
I think it misses like a self-sacrifice. I think it misses, Paul talks about a body mm -hmm. that, that the functions of the body is all together, but that the pieces of the body are different. Mm -hmm. And we need all the pieces of the body to be operating together. And so if like all the pointer fingers get together and go, no, no, church for me is being a pointer finger. That's all we need. Mm -hmm. Then we miss the body. And so what we need to do is we need, yes, we need to be meeting in homes. Yes, we need to be meeting in church at home groups. Yes, we need to be meeting and gathering in smaller groups, mm -hmm. e-groups, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's part of the model, right? But we can't just be doing that and separate out. So is that clarifying? And if it's not, would you uh, try to jump in? And I think it is a lot more clarifying. I think what can feel confused is we literally have, like we were literally promoting, right, a hiking group to go and listen and talk about the word and stuff. And so I think the piece, just to be clear, is that, you know, our, our church at home groups, our hiking groups, our things we're gathering together, but there is also a larger group mission that we're all a part of. Yep. And even though that looks different, especially right now, but the thing about it is, is, you know, we anticipate this to continue, um, our kind of different expressions to potentially continue in a way. And so just to be clear, there is not, we're not speaking against those things, not and, at all. you know, just trying to be clear that it's that we are all part, we're still moving together, even though maybe we're not all together. And that's the part, is right? The distinction w that you're, that to is make? the distinction okay. I'm trying to make. So, and maybe I could say it like this, small groups and groups meeting in homes is, is right, but it's not complete without being connected to a larger to something mission. bigger. Mm -hmm. And so yep. and that's the encouragement that if that's a passion in your heart, make sure you're always connected, whether it's Element Church or somewhere else, to a larger mission Correct. where you have um, leadership and voices and something to be a part of. And that doesn't have to be Element, but make sure Correct. that's a part of it what It can be, saying. I okay. mean, there's so many, there's so many, um, right. and again, the, the guys, like, part of the confusing thing, right, is, is like people say, like, what is the church? It's like, well, you know, because Element Church is a church, right? But Element Church is not the church in Lansing. Element mm -hmm. Church is part of the church in Lansing, the greater Lansing area, the East Lansing area. So, but what you have to refuse to do, I think, is to segment yourself off and become like this island little alone. island alone. And so whatever it is, be part of whatever group that's moving together that you want, but make sure that group puts you in positions with other parts of the body and make sure that group puts you in a place where there's relationships where sometimes you're uncomfortable. Make sure that group puts you in a place where you have a shared mission that's bigger than yourself. Right, which is why yep. even as Element Church, we're not a loner church. Correct. You know, we're part of the ARC. We're part of the next level relationship. Uh, relational network, but and we're you know, part we're of Coggle, the Church yeah. of Greater Lansing, and we're well, we're part but of like our oversight and stuff. Anyways, okay, awesome, great, all right. So thank you. So hopefully some of that's clarifying you guys. And hey, if you have specific questions, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to me. And you know what? And I'm going to be trying to do some additional teaching on some of this in the days to come too. I just think it's really important for us as we kind of um, have dealt with it. It's been an interesting year, mm -hmm. and I think that that interesting year has created some things that I just wanted to caution our church against. And I think that that was important. So okay. thank you for that. Cool. All right, let's go into worship. Awesome. You guys, well, let's move into worship this morning. Let's center Jesus back into our hearts and let's worship together. <laughs> 